What's up everybody, GenX Dividend Investor here. In this fun video I answer some questions that I'm often asked by my subscribers, which is why I don't go into higher yielding stocks to be able to make over $300,000 a year in dividends. So please do me a favor and hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Now if you're new to my channel and want to see my dividend portfolio in detail, then watch a video I recently did called How Did My Dividend Portfolio Do in 2022? When I do videos showing my portfolio, I'll often get questions like this one from Chris, who asked why did I have so much in Apple stock if I was going for dividends, and if I redeployed my Apple position into other stocks, I could bump up my annual dividend income from $92,000 a year to between $100 to $110k a year. He also mentioned that I could invest in Jeppy with its 12% yield. So first of all, I think that's a decent suggestion, and I'll elaborate why I haven't done it so far, though I may do something like that someday. For reference, my current average weighted portfolio dividend yield is 3.65%, and I have about $260,000 in Apple stock, and just it alone yields $1,600 a year in dividends. Anyways, if I did sell out of my Apple stock and reinvested all of that into Jeppy, which Seeking Alpha says is currently yielding 12.23%, then my annual dividend income would increase by another 30 k a year, which is a ton more. And if I went even further and converted my entire portfolio into Jeppy, then I'd be making around 325 grand a year in dividends, which is where I got the title for this video from. Now it's helpful to understand that part of the reason that my Apple position is the largest in my portfolio was because I lumped some 70k into Apple just a few years ago, and it ballooned to what it is today at around 260k, i.e. I'm up around 300% in a relatively short time frame. I didn't think it would grow that quickly, and that's what she said. But I like it enough that I think it'll keep going, so for now I'll stay long, and I'm clearly not the only person in that camp as we have people like Warren Buffett, who also has Apple as the largest position in Berkshire, and who's been buying even more of it lately. Of course, if I didn't believe in Apple then I'd trim my position some, or if some of my companies cut their dividends a ton, or if I simply wanted more passive income, then selling out of super low yield stuff like Apple and Microsoft, and then going into higher yield stuff, would be something I'd consider. The TLDR is that I'm able to stay retired due to getting enough dividends to pay my bills even with having some low yield stocks like Apple and Microsoft. My dividends have been an example of having your cake and eating it too. I keep eating my dividends every month and they keep coming back. It's like an everlasting gobstopper for you Charlie and the Chocolate Factory fans. Side note, a new Willy Wonka movie is scheduled to come out this December and it'll be about Wonka's origin story of how he ended up becoming a chocolatier. Anyways, I also like to live simply and frugally, and I think that I have a reasonable chance of seeing my dividend income continue to trend up over time, with some setbacks here and there. Thus, between my dividend hikes and me slowly reinvesting a small amount of my dividends back into my portfolio, I think that my cash flow, which is already covering me, will keep improving. And what do I mean when I say I live frugally? Well, I'm fine owning my Ford Escape that has over 100,000 miles on it. I mean I'd rather shop at Target than Nordstrom. I like to buy at Costco, etc. Frugally for me doesn't mean living like a homeless person, it just means trying not to waste too much money. But I still have a 90 inch TV and I pay for Apple Music and YouTube TV and Netflix and Apple TV and blah blah blah. I could cut back way more if I needed. Being frugal also means that I'm aware of every dollar going out of my pocket, just like I know of everyone coming in. I have spreadsheets that give me visibility into my recurring monthly and annual expenses, which I highly encourage everyone to create, because having that visibility gives you options to change things as you think makes sense. Try to minimize being surprised by money going in or out, as much as is pragmatic. I have low and high estimates for how much I think I'll make and spend each month. And while I care about being comfortable, I'd still rather save money by flying coach rather than first class. That's what I mean when I say try not to waste too much money. I still go on vacations and eat out sometimes, I just try to avoid wasting money unnecessarily. I'm also someone who is okay having a bit of discomfort in favor of securing a stronger future. I see my low yield stocks in Apple and Microsoft as having a lot of staying power and cash generation long term potential, so they are also a bit of my break in case of emergency stocks. They are rip cords that I can pull and sell if needed, and I'd rather try to defer selling them and instead just live within my means so I keep my finances a bit tighter, but with various safety nets in place. My Apple and Microsoft positions are also a hedge, or a balance, against some of the riskier stocks in my portfolio. Still I have some other options to further increase my cash flow that I'll elaborate on later. Anyways, Jeppy is a pretty compelling income fund run by a quality company, but I don't fully understand its risk profile, specifically around their usage of ELNs. I've spent some time coming up to speed on how ELNs work, even though after doing so I still have some questions that I'd want answered before I'd feel comfortable dipping my toes into it. And I know ELNs are only a small percentage of Jeppy's holdings, but it's still important for me to understand something fully before I invest in it. 
I actually emailed one of Jeppy's fund managers to try to get my questions answered, but so far he's not gotten back to me. Regardless, it'll be interesting to track how Jeppy does in the next few years, as it's only been around since 2020, and I don't draw too broad of conclusions over something that hasn't been around very long. Now, I wouldn't recommend income ETFs if you're young and trying to grow your net worth, as funds like that often limit your upside potential too much for my liking, but if you're retired like me, then I think a small percentage is worth considering. Another higher yielding ETF that looks kind of interesting to me is a covered call ETF called Devo. I've actually never had any kind of income fund before, so it would be interesting to gain hands-on experience with something like a Jeppy or a Devo, which aren't the same. One final thing to mention about Jeppy is that it may be less tax efficient than tickers that are normal qualified dividends, thus its actual in-pocket cash is less than the yield might indicate. Oh, and I doubt you could easily use it for tax loss harvesting. Anyways, I think Chris had a good suggestion, and hopefully you now have a better understanding of why I hold on to my Apple stock for now, even though I could make more in divvies if I wanted to higher yield stuff. Okay, another example comment I'll sometimes get is like this one from Kenneth, who basically suggested that if I invested 1.1 million of my portfolio into some of the high yield stocks he holds, including AGNC, a mortgage rate at over 14% yield, and I'm not a big fan of Emirates, PCF, an income fund at 13% yield, ACP, an income fund at 17.5% yield, EFC, an M rate at 16% yield, and DX, an M rate at 13%, then that alone would make me about $130,000 a year in dividends, and then I could invest my remaining $1.5 million in other tickers to get around $240,000 a year in divvies. And I think conceptually this is a reasonable idea, though the particular stocks he mentions I'm not enamored with. Anyways, in order to get to 240 k a year in dividends, then my average weighted starting yield would need to be 9%, which is too high for my conservative blood. And let me show you part of the reason why I tend to avoid high yield tickers and instead go with blue chip dividend stocks instead. Here's a backtest I ran in Portfolio Visualizer, comparing a portfolio of those high yield stocks mentioned versus the overall market, which is about how my portfolio does. And you can see that if I invested $1 million into those high yielders about 10 years ago, then today they would be worth $1.97 million and would have returned 6.3% a year, including dividends reinvested. Whereas had I invested that million into the overall market, then my portfolio would be worth $3.8 million, which would have been a 12.7% annualized return. So the high yield portfolio would have still doubled in value over 10 years from 1 million to 2 million, but going with the market it would have quadrupled my portfolio from 1 million to almost 4 million. Now what you'll usually find is that the higher the yield, the worse the stock appreciation potential and the worse dividend growth potential. Not only that, but higher yield tickers often have more of a tendency to go belly up or disappear way more than the conservative companies I invest in, some of which have been around for over 100 years. But Kenneth is actually suggesting something smarter than going only with high yield, which is to get some higher yield stocks along with some lower yield stocks, and I kind of do that right now in my portfolio, but just to a lesser extent. The nice thing about having higher yield stocks is that you obviously have more income, as long as they last. So it makes sense that the market outperforms income stocks and such, but that's part of the trade-offs you might want to make if you want more income now versus more total returns overall. Of course, the total returns crowd would say that you could always sell some shares and you'd still be ahead. And is that better? Well, it all depends on your needs and goals, thus you should tailor your portfolio to what you want and need. I'm someone who wants to remain retired on relatively safe, cash-flowing, passive assets, so having some income fund seems reasonable to me. Other people might have goals to get the highest income possible, and they might be open to taking on more risk than I am. Like I've seen portfolios where people only have two stocks in them that each has over 20% yield. To each their own. It's a pretty common trade-off to have more income for less stock appreciation, or vice versa. And why do I want stock appreciation? Well, even though I don't plan on selling my stocks, the reality is that sometimes I may still need to. So having a larger portfolio value gives me more financial security, as well as more financial options. Plus I want to leave as much as I can to my kids as possible, so each generation of mine can become more financially well off. Anyways, sometimes people are confused when I say that I have enough income, because they're like, wouldn't you always want more income? And the answer is it depends. Like I wouldn't want to go back to work and get a real job and lose my free time, that would be getting more income. Nor would I want to build a super risky high yield portfolio that would stress me out too much to own. So no, I don't always want more income, but I am open to more conservative passive income. Now if I wanted more safe passive income quickly, then one thing I could do would be to withdraw lots of dividends from my retirement accounts rather than reinvest them, since right now I'm trying to live as much as possible on just my taxable account divs. Or I could sell some stock in my retirement accounts, withdraw that cash, and pay taxes, including the penalty on the distributions. 
or if I wanted to materially raise my standard of living permanently, then I could do a 72T on my retirement accounts, which I talked about in a video called Secrets to Withdrawing Early from 401ks and IRAs, which would allow me to withdraw all my retirement funds over the next decade-ish without taking a penalty for withdrawing them early. Rule 72T refers to the section of the Internal Revenue Code that outlines the process of making early withdrawals from certain qualified retirement accounts without paying the normal early withdrawal penalties. You take what's called Substantially Equal Periodic Payments, or SEPPs, which lets you withdraw your funds out of your IRA before the normal age of 59 and a half without the early withdrawal 10% tax penalty. But there's a lot more to it you've got to be aware of. Now, generally speaking, you want to avoid touching your retirement accounts for as long as possible, unless you're sure you can retire before the normal retirement age, along with being aware of the other issues of 72Ts. If I did do a 72T, that would mean I'd sell something like $75,000 of stocks in my retirement accounts every year and take that as a cash distribution and then I'd pay taxes on it, but wouldn't pay a tax penalty, even though the money would be coming out before I was 59 and a half. And after taxes, that would be like another 50k of cash I could use for whatever, from investing to elevating standard of living to whatever. Bottom line, there are lots of things people can do for more cash, from options to lending shares to side gigs to whatever. I currently have extra income coming in from my social media stuff, some of which I donate, some of which I reinvest into my social media business, etc. Anyways, I get comments all the time asking about why I don't go into higher yield stocks, and the reality is it's easy to find high yield stocks, but it's harder to find stocks that meet your needs and goals and risk tolerances. Okay, moving on, another type of question I often get these days is like this one from Mark, who basically asks why I'd only want a 3.3% dividend return when there are better ways out there. And he mentioned inflation will eat up all that dividend return, and that treasury bonds are a guaranteed 4%. So my stocks have been averaging about a 7.3% dividend increase each year over the last five years, and inflation tends to run at 3 to 4% on average, so I don't worry about edge case years of 9% inflation or whatever, because historically I've seen how edge cases don't make long-term trends. Plus, when I look at my stocks, I also consider things like how much stock appreciation I'm getting, not just my dividend yield. Now, having some high-yield treasury bonds is often one of the safer bets you can make, but long-term they tend to underperform the stock market. So holding a small percentage of your net worth in them is understandable, but for me personally I'd rather stick with quality companies that I think will be around long after I'm six feet under. Now another reason I don't sell out of everything and go into treasuries is because I'd face a big tax bill. And yet another reason is that due to my health issues, I need a portfolio that I'm confident will keep producing cash even if I'm not around to buy and sell. At some point treasuries mature, whereas I think Microsoft and McDonald's have a higher probability of continuing to pay dividends for generations. And keeping all your money as cash in the bank, as opposed to stocks, has its own problems of significantly fluctuating interest rates and inflation and such. I mean, right now cash has a great interest rate, but I'm confident it will go back down to under 1% again at some point, and I wouldn't want to put my portfolio into a state where I'm totally reliant on bank interest rates to pay for my family's welfare. So having some cash is good, and I like to keep a few months of expenses in an emergency fund, but moving material portions of my assets into cash doesn't align to my needs. That doesn't mean you can't do what you think makes sense. And of course, I'd also have to deal with tax issues in my taxable account if I move constantly into cash and then back into stocks and bonds and blah blah blah. Bottom line, my investing approach isn't perfect, but it feels pretty good to me. And it's low stress, it's truly passive, doesn't require competency to get cash, and ultimately should accomplish my goals of making sure my family is set up without me being here. I'm betting my portfolio will keep producing cash flow, even if some banks go under, or the war in Ukraine, or whatever. But will I sell out of some Apple and Microsoft and go into higher yield stuff someday? Maybe, anything's possible. Will I start a 72T in my retirement accounts? Someday. I like having options and I'm happy where I am right now. Could some of my companies cut their dividends? Sure, and then I'd adjust if I wanted to. Remember, the market has a way of balancing risk and reward, and usually anything that looks too good to be true often is. I've been investing in the stock market for around 30 years now, and the older I've gotten, the more I've come to value low stress investing. It's all about quality. Quality, quality, quality is my Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. And if you get that reference, then leave me a comment down below. And speaking of comments, the last one I'll mention in this video, and the one that I love seeing, is when someone proudly talks about how much annual dividend income they have. My common response is usually something like, that's awesome, and I hope it's coming from solid companies. I.e., I'm trying to make sure they aren't tunnel visioning on their dividend yield, without also being aware of the risks of where their dividends are coming from. Anyways, I'm a conservative investor and my goals and risk tolerances are unique to me. I own some stocks I consider riskier, like my tobacco stocks, which are also my highest yielders. If they got regulated out of existence, then I'd probably do that 72T if I hadn't yet, and or I'd sell out of some lower yielders in favor of higher yielders. 
Overall, I play for the long term, and I'm happy to do the harder thing in the present to enable a better future down the road, and I constantly weigh the risk-reward scenarios of different things I might do. Whatever you do, just make sure to keep investing in a basket of quality stocks, or even easier an ETF like VTI, and then keep doing that until the end of time. Just don't quit when times get rocky or tough. And speaking of Rocky, think about the ending of Rocky 1. I'm going to spoil it for you now, so fast forward if you grew up on a deserted island and never watched Rocky. So the first film ends with Rocky losing, by judge's decision, to the heavyweight champ Apollo Creed. But Rocky still won a personal victory from going the distance, making it through 15 rounds in the ring. My point is that if you take managed risks and you invest intelligently, you'll get knocked down sometimes, but as long as you keep getting back up, you'll win. Just keep trying to do the right thing, keep making sacrifices, take managed risks, and realize that you are already winning by doing something that the majority of people in the world aren't doing, which is investing. And remember Morgan Housel's advice when he said, good investing is not necessarily about making good decisions. It's about consistently not screwing up. So keep investing intelligently, or rather, keep investing not stupidly, and I think you'll win. And with that, I'd like to finish things up by shouting out Garand Hero, who just boosted my dividend discord. I'd also like to thank YDD Marco, who signed up for an entire year as a Patreon aristocrat, so we locked in a 10% discount. Aristocrats gain access to my dividend spreadsheet product that I use in my videos, and they get to be in multiple private channels on my dividend discord chat server, where I let my upper tier Patreons watch my videos before I release them publicly on YouTube, as well as let them vote on which thumbnails I use in my videos, and of course they get more direct access to me. I also do a shout out as you just heard, and then I add them to my scrolling news ticker if I still have space on it. And if you made it this far in the video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Finally, I highly recommend that you join my free Dividend Discord chat server, which has around 10,000 dividend investors on it from around the world. Thanks for watching, stay positive, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.